Ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank all of you for coming to this meeting of the Clinton Global Initiative in Asia. We decided to come to Hong Kong because of the region's leadership and capacity to make a difference on the major issues of our time. And the presence of so many distinguished people here today from all walks of life reaffirms that judgment. We have today 11 former and current heads of state, about 195 business leaders, and leaders from the civil society sector and the philanthropy sector. What made this meeting different from others is that we ask each participant to make a specific commitment to action, to do something new and measurable, to address problems like poverty, education, health care, climate change, religious and ethnic conflicts, or other challenges which exist today in the world. In Asia, the results have been striking. More than 340 of these commitments have directly impacted Asian nations. From everything from improving irrigation and employment in India to assisting local mayors in China in their efforts to improve energy efficiency, to helping women and children who are the victims of human trafficking across the region. This region has enormous intellect, industry, and interest in improving our world. From India to the Philippines, inspiring models of philanthropy and corporate responsibility are already making a big difference. With the challenges we have been facing a long time, our shared susceptibility to global warming, to disease, the scarcity of food, the increasing scarcity of water, the stark reminder we have in the last few days in India of the exposure to terrorism we all share, and the global troubles in the financial market, I believe our work has never been more important because the government cannot solve all these problems alone. We need partnerships with the private sector and civil society. In a larger sense, the recent prosperity of Asia, as in America, has not reached every household. And therefore, even before the financial crisis, persistent inequality has seemed to be an unfortunate side effect of many of the good things which are happening in the interdependent world. The gap between rural and urban areas continues to widen. And more than two-thirds of the world's poor people live in Asia, even as the most burgeoning economies are also here. In some regions, half the people still lack access to adequate sanitation, not counting China. In the rest of Asia, rates of child malnutrition equal those in sub-Saharan Africa. Over the past 20 years, the rise of India, China, and other nations in Asia have impressed the rest of the world. Asia was an obvious choice for this meeting of CGI. As other economies attempt to navigate these crises, I will say again, I think all of us here can make a contribution by working together in new and creative ways. We have the capacity to do this. This is quite an interesting time to be having a meeting like this, but I am profoundly grateful that all of you are here. I spend almost all my time now, and I've been honored to work in China on the AIDS problem. I try to think about how to turn people's good intentions into real changes. And that's what the Japan was able to do, partly by not subsidizing energy and having to import it all, but they think about systems, and, and that's the only reason that only six countries are not gonna make their Kyoto targets. The rest of the people at San Kyogo were not stupid or lazy or dishonest. They were good people. They wanted to do this. They could not figure out how. Now, there's no region in the world that has a better reputation for figuring out how than Asia. And I guess I'm asking, pleading almost with you, not only for more examples coming out of Asia, but for leadership as we go into this uh, the development phase with the, with the new treaty. 
But 18% of the world's greenhouse gas emissions every single year come from deforestation. And it's, it's really tough. And in my neck of the woods, we worry most about it in the Amazonia, in Brazil, and the other countries of the Amazon rainforest. But it's a big challenge for Indonesia and other places. It's, very, it's one thing to say that you shouldn't do this, but the economics have to be worked out if you want people to leave these precious rainforests up. And in Asia, it's even more important for cultural biodiversity because you have, for example, half of all the world's languages spoken in Papua New Guinea alone, and we have representatives from Papua New Guinea here. And in those Indonesian islands near it in the provinces, this is a profoundly important thing. So, uh, well, I've made the point I want to make. I, uh, these people prove that you will, they will do the right thing, and we can do the right thing, but we need more attention on how to get the private sector involved by thinking not about just what the goals are, but how to do it. We have a distinguished uh, Lord Mayor from Australia here who's going to be on another program. I'll tell you the Australians are also working on big solar thermal uh, possibilities, but they've given an enormous amount of thought to how to do it. So I, I leave that with all of you. It's one thing to be for sustainable development and to be for a new climate change treaty, quite another thing to know how to do it that is pro-jobs and pro-growth. You heard the foreign minister say that China will be for it if he, we can demonstrate that it is. You can't demonstrate it unless you know how to do it. And Japan's done a better job so far than any other country on earth. Thank you very much. We'll go on with the program.